Hello, it's uh, Mark Holmes here, the Editorial Director of VIA Satellite, and we're back for a, another Thursday morning conversation. Uh, before I introduce our guest, um, it's now I was working out, it's almost a year since Satellite last year, which seems um, slightly surreal and a little bit crazy. And it's also International Women's Day today as well. And I'm delighted to have joining me for what's going to be a really interesting conversation today, Jennifer Manor from uh, Echo Star Hughes. Um, but firstly, Jennifer, I mean, how are you doing? How have you been? I'm doing okay. You know, um, I miss my old life of uh, seeing, you know, for instance, just speaking about a year ago, you know, seeing all the people who I've known so well over the years at the satellite show and, of course, traveling. It's you know, but I think, you know, but we're, I think we're getting out. I think there's light at the end of the tunnel. We just all have to be patient. So I think that's a really good thing. And how has life been at home? We, we often start these conversations by talking about um, dramas, uh, movies you've been watching, music you've been listening to. So tell us a little bit about some of the, uh, the, the favorite things you've been watching or in your household. So, um, it's an interesting question. So I'd say probably what always keeps me the busiest while I'm home, of course, is work, um, you know, at Echo Star Hughes. And, you know, we're, that keeps me always busy and is actually something I really enjoy. Um, but then um, I don't watch much TV, so I'm not going to be able to tell you about any Netflix series that I binge on. Um, my, my secret is I, I happen to really like law and order for its repetitive nature so um I, I will turn to law and order occasionally but mostly watch news and you know movies that are out you know then there really haven't been that many that have excited me this year I, I think it's been a hard year and but what i have been spending time in is um i've been filming a movie so it's been which we started work on um and i want to say 2019 a yeah. film called when wire was king the transformation of telecommunications and we were in the middle of a, a pretty critical period of having to interview our subjects when the pandemic hit. So that's been challenging. So, so that's something that I've been working on in my off time as well as, I don't know if you know, I'm also an artist. Um, so I've been doing some painting as well, which has been fun. Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, it's really interesting. I mean, obviously, you know, with, with your job of regulatory affairs and sort of documentary movie making, you wouldn't necessarily make that, uh, association so let's go let's go back a bit when did you start getting getting into this and tell us a little bit, bit about your background in terms of um sort of making documentaries and films sure so um just for full disclosure i went to college at the state university of new york at albany on a theater scholarship um i wanted to be an actress my scholarship was actually in playwriting um, it turns out, though, my husband may feel differently that um, I'm not as, as, as good an actress. I, I realized in college that this wasn't going to be, I wasn't going to be the next, um, you know, name your favorite great actress. Uh, and so I also did a double major in political science, but I've always been um, interested in, in plays and always interested in theater, but never in documentaries and never the back office stuff, never producing, directing was never anything um, I wanted to do. I've had a couple of plays produced, but nothing more than that. Um, so um, it, it, it isn't a natural progression. It actually comes from um, my writing. Um, as I've written two books on telecom, Spectrum Wars and Telecommunications Market Access. So I always pride myself on, I think I'm a pretty good writer. And I, of course, appeared in your publications and appreciate that. Um, and one day, I was at a wedding for a colleague of mine um, from a, a different company than Echo Star Hughes. Um, and I was sitting next to kind of an elder statesman in the industry. And we were having dinner and he was telling me the most amazing stories that I never knew about. And when we left, and I don't wanna use his name because I don't wanna insult anyone, I kind of said, oh my God, he's going to, you know, maybe he'll live another 10, 15 years and no one will ever hear these stories. So I said, I know what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna write an oral history because you know I write a book so I can do anything, yeah. I can write a play. And I started to interview um, some folks. And at that point, you know, my focus, one of my huge focuses on, uh, has always been on the, the creation of competition. And I think competition is critical to our industry. I think it's critical to the satellite industry as well. Um, so I was really focused capturing that story because that's really the story I talked about with this gentleman. Um, and so I started to write and I said, this sucks. I'm not getting any of the color. I'm not, a, I'm not William Kennedy. 
I, I'm not picking up any of the color of these people and this is gonna be lousy, so I wanna make a documentary. So then we'll fast forward, I start buying all these books, I start talking to everyone, who should I talk to? And then um, the politics kind of changed in the country and my husband is a, is a neuro, neuroscientist who works on um, a model organism called zebrafish. I know this sounds like I'm out of order, but it's how I think, so I apologize. Um, so um, there was a question on scientific funding, and we've always talked about how, how the zebrafish, which is a, a really unique scientific model, um, is a really cost-effective way to do science. So when all this was changing and there were questions, I woke up one morning and said to my husband, I know I'm going to make a short documentary about the importance of zebrafish for biomedical research and that will give me the credentials so I can make the movie I really want to make because on telecom, but I knew I had to do something first. So, uh, so fast forward. So we produce Zebrafish Practically People, which is available. I'm going to give a plug, www.zebrafishfilm.org, and it's free for people. It's a nine-minute, 50-second um, documentary on the benefits of zebrafish for biomedical research, and we actually ended up being um, winning a number of film festivals. And I was actually a finalist in the Cannes Film Festival, um, which was super excited. I got to hang out with John Travolta and I are now like that. But, um, but it was a very unique experience. The most interesting part of that for this crowd was um, it's a closed festival. And so only people who are invited to the festival can go. And then even though it's closed, you have to fight for tickets. So. I was lucky that year they were doing the remake of 2001 A Space Odyssey. So um, I got to go and they actually, and being a New Yorker, I'm fairly good at getting to the front of the line, um, which positioned us that the cast sat in the middle of the theater, so we were right near the cast. So, um, so it was very exciting to see that. Um, so then um, once that was finished, I started working um, with some of the same people who worked with me on When Wire Was King on this movie. And we've been in production since 2018, late 2018, really early 2019, um, with the plan to try and get it out in 2020, but the pandemic had other ideas. So um, that's a long story too. Uh, Great story. <laughs> how, sur how surreal was it? I mean, you know, for someone that's steeped in satellites all of a sudden be at this sort of closed, film festival or, you know, hanging out with some celebrities and, and stuff? Well, the problem is I don't recognize them when I see them. So <laughs> um, so I'm not sure that I always, uh, John Travolta is pretty obvious, but um, it was pretty cool. One night we were coming, we couldn't get, um, there was this Spike Lee movie out, and I can't remember the na name, it just won the Academy Award. It was a great film, um, was premiering at that event and we couldn't get tickets and we were coming out of our hotel one, we were going into our hotel at night and they had a 12 Venn Dine premiere and Spike Lee was leaving our hotel. Um, so, you know, some, as I'm saying, we were, you know, but it was, it was a super cool experience. It was even, my husband was with me, who's a neurobiologist. So, you know, scientists at George Med. So if you think about it that way, it was probably even more surreal for him. At least I was a theater major in college and, so that I mean, it, it is amazing. So I mean, this new one, when Wire was king. Um, I mean, you obviously you said it's been delayed because of the pandemic. What, uh, how long is it? How long is it going to be? And and when ultimately did, did you hope to, to get that out? So it's an it's an hour and a half film. Is our director's cut? We actually have our first rough cut done. Yeah. Um, we're, we're heavily at work on the archival material because you can't make a his historical documentary without archival material and you would be surprised how difficult it is to find things from those from the time periods and I'm talking even going back to the 70s and 80s really where you know in the United States that was the the real time frame where, where you started to see dramatic changes um, and then we still have to you know have our compo we still have our music to be done and post-production work um, so we're hoping to have it finished post-pandemic when people can actually gather because I really would like to do the premiere in person. So we're thinking in the fall of 2021, we'll have it out is my hope. But, um, you know, things could always, things sometimes take longer than you think they do. So I'm always, I'm always more ambitious than perhaps I should be.
No, that's good. I mean, you mentioned that this one is very much the, the one that you really wanted to do. Do you, do you have a, a follow up already in your mind for what after this one's out? What, what, what is next for you in, in this regard? So this was a really difficult part of the film. So when we started, I had this view that we would include everything. Um, and then when I was at, and this was another learning experience for me. When we started interviewing people, I realized how much I didn't know about what happened in the past. You know, this was before my time in the 70s and 80s. I like to say I wasn't, I was still in school then, um, at times elementary school, just to be clear. Um, and, um, and so we did, we really had to spend a lot of time and figure out what was our story and how are we gonna grasp people? So we narrowed our story down, um, although we, start walking through kind of, you know, AT&T and all that and go through the Husha phone and all the key areas. We really focus our film on a, on a unique period in history, which I hadn't realized was so unique, which is there was a gentleman named uh, uh, Clay, Clay, quote, Tom Whitehead, um, who was in the Nixon administration and, and was the first head of the Office of Telecom Policy. And actually, brought competition and, and ultimately, ironically, after he left the White House, he went to work at Hughes and then founded SES. So there is a satellite nexus, but that wasn't the reason we chose to do the movie on him, but it still as an, it makes me feel good. Um, he, the first effort at, at um, liberalization or really uh, taking on the AT&T monopoly really on the government side in any meaningful manner was in their, uh, the open skies policy for satellite. Okay. And what made this so interesting, Mark, was um, Richard Nixon had um, felt that the press hated him. And he was very concerned that there were only two or three broadcast networks in the United States at the time. And AT&T was actually the largest owner of ComSat. And ComSat, which you probably remember, was the um, domestic satellite operator for Intelsat, right? The U.S. signatory and originally supposed to be the global system. It's another movie um, there. Um but that they ended up um, wanting to become the sole domestic provider of satellite service. And, and, and Tom Whitehead really took this on and, and looked at it not because he really felt that it needed to be competition. And if you think about it, a lot of the competition we see today in the broadcast, you know, in the cable and all the others was, it was just so expensive to get, the only carrier to get your television signals through was AT&T. So once you opened up the domestic satellite systems, you were able to have all these other methods of carriage. And we've interviewed Brian Lamb, who's the head of C or former head of C-SPAN, who was also in the Nixon administration at that time, but he wouldn't have been able to start C-SPAN for instance, without that lower cost. And then that led to divestiture and so forth and so on with a whole bunch of events. So that we kind of focused on that period and then going to what was the real reason that divestiture happened. Um, and that was fascinating. Um, part of it was spurned on actually a rough cut I put out this weekend about something we call the Schultz, the famous Schultz phone call, where George Schultz was going to, um, was the Secretary of Treasury and was going to do a bond offering and was concerned that if any actions were being taken against AT&T and its monopoly status, it would have been, uns it would have been unsuccessful because AT&T owned a significant portion of the U.S. national debt. Um, so all these, which really kick-started going towards divestiture. So, and then we, we pick up from there and we certainly cover the rest of history, but at very high level. So I do want to get back to um, one of my favorite areas always was the, the Communications Act of 1964 and John F. Kennedy's vision for a global system, you know, and the role that Rene Anselmo played, for instance. Um, that's certainly an area I'd like to do, but there's so many others, you know, MCI and Burt Roberts, I was at MCI for years. Um, you know, so I could see this going into a series. I just have to be honest. It's a very expensive hobby. <laughs> I was going to, I mean, I have a couple of sort of um, follow-up questions. It's fascinating discussion. I mean, you've talked about sort of telecoms, but obviously you're also, as we know, steeped in, in satellite. Is there a, a space documentary, a, a pure space satellite documentary in your future, do you think? Well, I did promise my husband I would do Zebrafish 2 next, so there'll be a Zebrafish 1 in between, but that'll be a short documentary. But I, I really do want to capture um, the story of Intelsat and then you know, also the role of Pan Amsat, which I always thought was an incredible story on how we ended up with international competition. Because 
it, it may never have happened, right? If it wasn't for, uh, and I think that's one thing that's really unique about the, about all these stories. You know, you had MCI, um, you know, with Bill McGowan really taking on AT and T, you know, and putting his heart and soul. You have Renee Salmo who really put his heart and soul into taking on the Intel Sat monopoly. You know, these I'd say larger than life personalities. I, you know, are something that I think are critical. And and the other thing, to be honest, is capturing this history before before we lose the ability to talk to certain people. Unfortunately, um, during the documentary filming, even some of the people I had wanted to talk to were no longer available through no fault of their own. Um, so it's just something that, you know, the clock's ticking and you do want to capture it. And, and that was one of the things I found most interesting as we're gathering all archive, archival material, Mark. So I'm hoping as someone with via satellite and access intelligence is making sure that these documents are available um, because so much of the information that we know is out there that people have told us about is just unfoundable. You can't find it. And perhaps the most important question I'm going to ask you today is how on earth do you find time to do this when you're you know doing an amazing job for echo star hughes on the regulatory side and you're, you know you're making these amazing award-winning documentaries films how can you do that in 24 hours a day I'm, I'm i'm sort of a little bit stunned that you can fit all of that in i'm a much better person if i'm busy <laughs> So, um, you know, it's just something that I, I, I think it helps, you know, and the other thing is to be fair, um, both at Echo Star Hughes, I have a great staff um, who make me always look good and make the company look good. And then of course, I have a cr tremendous crew um, working with me on When Wire Was King, um, you know, true professionals. Um, uh, Cliff Hackles, my story editor, who, who has countless awards and Leanne Dance is my screenwriter, one of my screenwriters with Wendy Leonard, but also my archivist and they're both producers. So they also, I have to say, they do a tremendous amount of work. Um, so I wish I could take as, as well as the rest of my crew. You have to sometimes, I mean, it, it sounds like from when you did, the, from when you did the first one and that, that things just escalated like really quickly in terms of all of a sudden you're getting a lot of attention. Do you sometimes have to like pinch yourself to believe that this is all, that this is, this is, this is all, all happening? When I got the call from the Cannes Film Festival, I was driving out of the Hughes parking lot and I was actually going to, speaking of it being International Women's Day, I was, I had put together um, a happy hour for some of the women in the satellite industry. So we were making, meeting in Tyson's yeah, you know, I was rushing to get there and I see this number from California and I'm like, I actually tried to get rid of the phone call because I didn't know who it was. I was like, oh, robocall. And when the woman told me, I almost, let's put it this way, I was good, I was still in the parking lot um, because I almost fell off my chair. I mean, it was something I had never even considered, um, you know, except in, in jest. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, a, it's fantastic. I mean, when, um, when I was told about it, I thought this would be such a great Thursday morning conversation. I mean, to actually, uh, you know, I mean, you're clearly uh, really talented. You don't get these sort of recognition if, if you're not putting together great content. So it's just fantastic. I mean, I wish you all the best for uh, when I was king and, and future endeavors. Obviously, we've loved having you uh, write stuff for us at Via Satellite. And now, you know, I'm uh, two steps away from John Travolta. So hopefully we can get <laughs> a, a Thursday morning um, conversation. Jennifer, I mean, it's really been an, an absolute pleasure today to, uh, um, you know, talk with you about this. It's such a it's such a different, I think, Thursday morning conversation. Mm -hmm to what we've what we've done before and uh you know i look forward I, I really want to you know as someone that actually when i was a journalist i started in telecoms rather than satellite so i actually interviewed a lot of telecoms ceos in in the 90s when i sort of started so uh i don't go unfortunately back to the 80s but uh i, I do i did uh, interview some real characters amongst the uh the telecoms community in in the 90s from uh, Bernie Ebers, Joe Nascio, Dwayne Ackerman, uh, Bill Ezra, uh, way before I joined the satellite sector. So I'm, I'll be fascinated to uh, um, see your documentary. So uh, yeah, this has been great. I just want to thank you for, for taking the time to, to talk to us today. Um, I wish you best of luck. I, I hope you get um, 
I hope you get the uh, documentary out this year. Definitely want to be watching it. So let me know. Let let the satellite community know. I'm sure yeah, of a, few of us, a few of us want want to be watching it. And uh, likewise, we know it's a big year for Hughes as well. So we're, we're looking forward to celebrating uh, their 50 year anniversary. So I, I you know wish you and your loved ones to um, stay safe and healthy this year and have a good year and. Uh, I know it's been a year since satellite, but hopefully, fingers crossed, at some point we we can uh, we can see you all soon. So thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.